charity for the pleasure of a love, the pleasure of a love. Oh, you who believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan, night of Ramadan. Welcome, O oh Ramadan, it is Ramadan, it is Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I am your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will be discussing the topic Ramadan, the month of supplications. Dr. Zakia, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, Dr. Zakir, yesterday we were talking about Ramadan as being the month of repentance. And because it was such a lengthy topic, we didn't cover all of the uh, viewers' questions. Today, we will cut short the interview in exchange for answering the viewers' questions Inshallah. on the topic generally about repentance and supplication. There's such a small difference between the two, but it's a world in itself. But Dr. Zakia, if I could just pose the first question today, why is Ramadan referred to often by many people as being the month of supplications? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in, amma ba'd. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim Rabbi shuhli sadri, wa silli amri, wa ahlul uqdata min lisaani yafqahu kawli. Before I answer a question, I would like to first define what is the meaning of the word supplication. Supplication means to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the almighty and glorious, with devotion, with sincerity and solemnity, and with complete submission. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Tirmidhi, Hadith number 2616, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that there are three gates of goodness. The first is fasting, which is a shield from the hellfire. Second is a sadka, that is charity. That charity extinguishes sin, same as water extinguishes fire. And the third is standing in prayer in the late hours in the night. So here we realize there is a relationship between supplication, prayer, and fasting. And Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 186, Allah says that if my servants ask thee concerning me, tell them I am indeed close to them. And I listen to the prayer of every supplicant and tell them that if they listen to my call, willingly, and if they believe in me, I will take them to the straight path. Here we realize the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala along with his believers, his servants and slaves. And he says, if my slaves, if my servants, my servants means the closeness that the human beings have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they ask me concerning me, tell them I am indeed close to them. It shows the closeness between the believers and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, I will respond to them. And Allah further says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 32, but ask from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our beloved Prophet Musa said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6502, the beloved Prophet said, that Allah says, ask me and I will give it to you. Ask me a protection and I will protect you. And as far as Ramadan being called as the month of supplication, a beloved prophet said. It's mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Al-Bayhaqi, Hadith number 6393, where the beloved prophet said, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not reject the prayer of three kinds of people. One is the father who prays for his child, his son or daughter. The second is a fasting person, especially when he breaks his fast. And the third is a traveler. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he further said, it's mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Ibn Majah, Hadith number 1643. The Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emancipates the slaves from the hellfire during every hour when the fast is broken. And does this every night. And a beloved Prophet also said, it's mentioned in Sahih Hadith of Sahih at tarqib Hadith number 988. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ransoms the Muslims from the hellfire every day and night in the month of Ramadan. And he answers the prayer of every Muslim every day and night in the month of Ramadan. So because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he listens to the supplication of the person who fasts and he gives a special status, that's the reason Ramadan is called as the month of supplication. Beautiful reason for calling it the month of Ramadan as being the month of supplication. And furthermore, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Zakir, if you could explain what are the etiquettes of supplicating towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The person should remember that he should only ask from Allah and no one else. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatiha, chapter number one, verse number five, Iyya qana abdu wa iyya They will only worship, they will only ask for help. You should ask only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 60, you ask me and I will answer your prayer. You can ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anything. Even if it be a small thing or a big thing, no problem. You can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anything. And furthermore, we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with humbleness and with humility. That's point number three. Point number four, when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should ask with confirmed hope that inshallah, Allah is going to answer our supplication. Number five, we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with fear. We should ask with taqwa, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number six, we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with extreme longingness, that inshallah we long this and he will answer our prayer. Besides these six points, there are some additional things which are important when a person supplicates. It's preferable, for example, a person should preferably be in wudu, in ablution. It's not a fard. He can even supplicate without being in wudu. But if he's like a person is in prayer, it's preferable that he's in wudu. Point number two, it's preferable that he's facing the Kaaba while supplicating, though it's not a fard. Point number three, he should repeat his supplication. It's preferable to repeat as much as possible. And point number four, he should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with single-mindedness and with longingness, as our beloved Prophet Muhammad said. It's mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Tirmidhi, Hadith number 3479, that the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that a person should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with single-mindedness. And inshallah, Allah will answer his prayers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like a person who asks with his heart when it is toying with trifle things. Heart is not in one place. So these are some of the etiquettes of a person supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakia. Regarding the aspects of uh, etiquette, of course, you've, add, you've added some uh, important points now, and that's very useful. What about the, the time and the place of supplication? Does that matter? As far as a person is concerned, he can supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any time of the day, any time of the night, 24 hours of the day. But there are some times which are preferred. For example, immediately after the obligatory prayers. For example, especially the day of Jummah, when a person is fasting, especially when he's breaking his fast. And when a person is praying in the sujood, also in the late hours of night. And the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, Hadith number 1655, the beloved Prophet said 
that there is an hour during the night in which there will not be a Muslim who will ask for the good without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granting it to him. That means there is an hour which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever the Muslim asks, supplicates, Allah will grant him. Further, beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, hadith number 1657, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest heaven after one third of the night is over. And then he says, I'm your Lord, I'm your Lord. Is there anyone who's there to supplicate to me? And I will answer him. Is there anyone to beg? And I will grant it to him. Is there anyone that requires forgiveness? And I will forgive him. So one of the good times is during the late hours of night, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends. And the hadith continues and says that Allah continues asking these questions till the dawn breaks. So one of the good times to supplicate is the late hours of night, just before dawn. SubhanAllah. Let's all get up and make sure. Does that mean uh, the last hours of the night, meaning like? Tahajjud, which you offer late one third or the middle third of the night. And as far as the place is concerned, again, a person can supplicate in any place. As the beloved Prophet ﷺ said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one in the book of Salah, hadith number 438 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for me and the believers the full earth as a place to pray. The full earth is a place where you can pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in spite, there are certain places that if you supplicate in the mosque, it's preferable. And amongst the mosques, there's no better mosque than the Harmain. The first is the Makkah, the Baytullah, and the second is the Masjid in Abbin Madina. MashaAllah. I wish we could be there now, Dr. Zakir. Inshallah, later on. Inshallah. Does the situation, uh, all the circumstances of the supplicant um, have any bearing on whether or not Allah accepts the dua? As I mentioned earlier, that the situation or circumstance he is in, if he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he can supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are certain situations which are preferable. For example, when a person is fasting, when a person is traveling, when a just ruler, when he supplicates, or a just imam, or a father supplicates for his son or daughter, or a person who has halal earnings and he supplicates, or it can be a person who prays in sujood. As our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in the Sahih Hadith of Tirmidhi in the book of supplication, Hadith number 3598, the Prophet said, the prayer of three people is never rejected. Number one is a just ruler or a imam. Number two, a person who's fasting, especially when he breaks his fast. And number three is an oppressed person. And the similar hadith which I quoted earlier of al Bahaki, hadith number 1693, where the Prophet said, the prayer of three people is never rejected. A father when he prays for his child, a fasting person, especially when he breaks his fast, and a traveling person when he prays. So the hadith of the Prophet these are the times which are preferred when a person supplicates as compared to others. Thank you, Dr. Zakir. And now we'll move to the next important point. Why is it that some people, that often when you're speaking to people, they say, oh, my dua hasn't been answered, you know? This is a common statement by the Muslim brothers and sisters you meet around the place. Why is it that certain supplications perhaps are not answered? There are certain criteria that are required. And many a time, the supplication is rejected because, point number one, maybe the earning is haram. What is eating is haram. Maybe the earning way he is driving all his lifestyle, maybe his business is haram may be involved in riba, usury, interest. He may be dealing in a business which involves bribing, may be dealing in a business which involves lying, cheating, etc. All these things which are related with haram things, that's the reason, it is one of the major reasons why supplication is not answered. Number two, maybe he is oppressing someone else, causing oppression to another human being. Number three, 
he may not be enjoining what is good and may not be forbidding what is wrong, which is a fard in Islam. And there are some other criteria required for a supplication to be accepted, and that's the reason why most of them are rejected. One is that we should not say that, oh Allah, forgive me if you please, oh Allah, bless me if you please, or oh Allah, grant me sustenance if you please. Because our beloved Prophet Muhammad he said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number nine, in the book of Tawheed, hadith number 7477, where the Prophet said that do not supplicate, do not pray by saying that, oh Allah, forgive me if you wish. Oh Allah, grant me mercy if you wish. Oh Allah, give me from your bounty if you wish. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does what he wills and you cannot command him. So saying such things is totally wrong, which many people do, which is a big mistake. That is the reason supplication are answered. Furthermore, people many a time, they give names to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which Allah never mentioned in the Quran, neither the Prophet used any of the Sahih Hadith. They call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which attributes and names which are not given by Allah and His Rasul. That is totally wrong by supplicating. Furthermore, many people when they supplicate, they add on many names and many things, for example. They say that, please forgive my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my uncle, my auntie, keep on. You know, so it becomes a big list. Instead of that, it's preferable to be brief and say that, please forgive my family or please forgive my relatives or my brothers and sisters in Islam. That's sufficient. And one of the other mistakes that people make is they normally supplicate very loudly. You know, very loud supplicate. Where Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 55, that ask to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with humility and privacy. Allah says in the next verse in Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse 56, that call to Allah with fear and longingness. So these are the basic mistakes that people make when they supplicate. And furthermore, many a time, when we ask something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we may follow all the things, but yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not answer our prayers. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 216, that you may dislike a thing which may be good for you, and you may like a thing which may not be good for you. Allah knows and you do not know. There may be a situation where a Muslim may pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me a motorcycle, a BMW. I want a BMW 1000 CC. And Allah does not understand his prayer. Because Allah knows that if Allah gives him a BMW, he may go fast, he may have accident, he may fracture his leg. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by not answering his prayer, is actually answering him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the knower of the unseen, of the future. So he may like a thing which may not be good for you. Allah knows and you do not know. Jazakallah khair. Um, that means the next question is very appropriate. So would you uh, now tell the viewers some authentic du'as which are good for them <laughs> that they can make in this month of mercy? There are hundreds of du'as which are authentic. And if you can refer to the book, Fortification of a Muslim through the supplications from the Quran and the authentic hadith, it's a book published which has more than 100 du'as. I think 129 to be precise. I'll just mention a couple of them from the Quran and the Hadith since your request is that. The most general dua, which is there in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 201, is Rabbana atina fid dunya hasnata wa fil akhrati hasnata kin azab in nar. Oh my Lord, give us the good in this world and the hereafter and save us from the torment of hellfire. This is the general dua, which is general and the best. There are various other du'as given in the Qur'an, and the du'as of the Qur'an are the best because this is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 8, رَبَّنَا لَا تُلْدِي قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدْ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَحَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْ كَرَهْمَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَحَابِ Which means, O Lord, let not our hearts deviate after Thou has guided us. And grant us mercy from Thy bounty, for Thou art the grantor of bounties. The other dua which I always make in the starting of any lecture, which is asking for help for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which you can do when you begin any speech or when you're doing something which is very difficult, is the dua which Musa alayhi salam made when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Musa alayhi salam 
then go and give the message to Pharaoh. So it's mentioned in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 25 to 28. Rabbi shuhali sadri, wa yisalli amri, wa halul ugdatum lisani yafkaf kawli, which means, O my Lord, expand my breast for me, and make my task easy for me, and remove the impediment which is in my speech, so that they will understand me. And you know Musa alayhi salam, he was a stammerer. And as many people are aware that even I, during my childhood, I was a stammerer. And even now I sometimes stammer. So that is the reason I read this dua at the beginning of every talk. So Musa alayhi salam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the impediment from his speech. And furthermore, so that they will understand me. And there is a barrier many a time between you and the person to whom you are giving the message. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may that barrier be removed. Therefore, before every talk, I supplicate so that the audience, if there's any barrier between the audience and myself, it is removed. These were just a few du'as from the Quran. There are several authentic du'as even from the Hadith. There's a Sahih Hadith in Tirmidhi as well as uh, Sahih Ibn Iban, where the Prophet said that anyone who says, Subhanallah wa bihamdi, which means glory be to Allah and praise be to Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will plant a date tree for that person in paradise. The other hadith which is there mentioned in Sahih Muslim, Book of Fikr, hadith number 6509, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anyone who says, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, glory be to Allah and praise be to him, if you mention 100 times, there's nothing more excellent for him on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection. Nothing better than that except someone who says similar words or someone who says something better. A similar hadith is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6405, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that anyone who says, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, glory be to Allah, and praise be to Allah a hundred times, his sins will be forgiven. Even if his sins are equal to the form of the sea. And there are various authentic hadith that also says in Sai Muslim, hadith number 749, that when you hear the call of the Muaddin, then you have to pray and say that I testify that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he has got no partners. And Prophet Muhammad sallam is the slave and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm pleased with my Lord, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm pleased with my messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and I'm pleased with my deen Islam. Anyone who says this, his sins will be forgiven. There are various such hadith, for example, after the Salah obligatory prayers, we say, Subhanallah, we say, Alhamdulillah, we say, Allah Akbar. If you say it 100 times, then your sins will be forgiven. There are other hadith, like after the obligatory prayers, we say, Allah manta salam, wa minka salam, tabakta zalali wal ikram. And in traveling, when we board any vehicle, any plane, any car, etc., dua which a prophet has said that Subhan al Lazi, Sakhalana Haza, wa makunna lo mukrinin, wa inna ila rabbina munkalibun. So these were just a few samples of the authentic duas from the Quran and the Sayyid Hadith. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir. As promised, we're cutting short the interview phase um, to allow for viewers' questions on the topic, if you don't mind, that is. My pleasure. We will now address some very important questions from the viewers on the topic. Now, question one from one of the viewers. The meaning of Allah's faddal. When we say, Oh Allah, I ask to give me from your grace faddal. Does it mean that we are precisely speaking about wealth? The word faddal actually means the grace or the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But literally, the word fadl, it means surplus. It means that you're giving something to someone without any payment. And when we say it is the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like we say, Hadha bin fazli rabbi. This is by the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is by the grace and favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means that the person receiving it, he actually does not deserve it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his mercy and grace, has given all these things. So when we say it is because of Fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are actually telling that 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us all these good things. It may be the wealth, not has to be wealth. It can be a good house, it can be a car, it can be whatever thing. He's given out of his grace and mercy, and we actually do not deserve any of this. It's only because of his grace that we have got it. So this is actually understanding that to show that we actually don't deserve all these things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his mercy and grace, because of being kind to his servants and slaves, he's giving all these things. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 61, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to punish each of the human beings for his wrongdoing, there would not be a single living creature on the face of this earth. So all this is due to the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mercy of Allah, the rahmat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second question posed by one of our dear viewers, Dr. Zakir, is what exactly is meant by the meaning of the word lamam? Translated here as, I believe, small faults in the verse of Surah Najm. There's a verse in the Quran, in Surah Najm, chapter number 53, verse number 31 and 32, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that to Allah belongs everything in heavens and the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything in the heavens and the earth. And he gives to every evil act according to the deeds. And he rewards every good act according to the best. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a person avoids the major sins and the shameful deeds, except the lamam, translated as small faults, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. Now there is a difference of opinion among the scholars as far as what is the meaning of this Arabic word lamam. If you read at tabri volume number two, page number 527, it says that according to most of the Salafs, they said that lamam, it means any sin done only once, even if it's a major sin. And this was the view of Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, Mujahid, may Allah have mercy on him, and so on and so forth. But if you read Qurtubi, volume 17, page number 71, here it says that, according to Sayyid ibn Musayb, he says that lamam means a thought which comes into your mind once and goes away. It means maybe an evil thought which comes and goes away. According to Al-Hasan ibn Fadl, he says that lama means forbidden glance that you give once, unintentionally, without the intention. But if you give a second glance, then it's a sin. As our beloved Prophet said, the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited. So if it's the first glance without intention, then it comes into the small sins of lama. And further, if you read in Tabri, volume number two, page number five to six and five to seven. Some of the scholars, they say that lama means the sins done by the Muslims before they accepted Islam at that time in the days of jahiliya, in the ignorance, which Allah will forgive all the sins. This is lama. Because when the non-Muslim mushrik used to tell those who became Muslims that these things used to do yesterday and now you say it's a sin. So this verse was revealed. Surah Najm, chapter 53, verse 31, 32, saying that stay away from the major sins and the shameful deeds. And what is the lamam means the past sins that I do, Allah will forgive. But according to most of the scholars, the majority of the scholars, they say that lamam means minor sins or small faults. And further, if you read the view of Imam Ragib, he says that lamam means small minor sins and the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, volume number eight, hadith number 6243, where Abne Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, he says that he does not know the meaning of lamam except what he heard from Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, who says that the Messenger of Allah said that every son of Adam has his share of adultery and he does it inevitably. The adultery of the eyes is a person giving a gaze which is forbidden. The adultery of the tongue is to speak. And what is in one's desire, his own wishes. And then his private part 
will either confirm or deny. So there's a difference of opinion as far as the word lamam is concerned. And further, if you read according to Imam An-Nawi, he says that lamam means what a person intends to do but does not do. Mm -hmm. A person thinks of doing but does not do. Means he's going towards that but does not do. These are small sins. Furthermore, the other scholars, they say these are specific small sins. But according to Qurtubi, volume number 17, page number 70, that lamam means minor sins or small faults, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah will forgive. And they give cross reference also in Nisa chapter 4, verse number 31, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as long as you stay away from major sins, he'll forgive your small sins. I think that's a very comprehensive answer, Dr. Zakir. Jazakallah khair. I'm sure that the brother or sister will take adequate knowledge from that answer to implement some changes in his or her life. Inshallah, let's move on to another section of questions regarding the month of repentance, which we didn't um, have time to answer last time out. Um, question one, is it permitted in supplication to negotiate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The question is, he goes on to say, for example, ask Allah to grant me something or forgive me and take something else away from me instead, like my health, for instance. When we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is beyond limits. His mercy, His grace. We cannot limit the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot try and negotiate. Or neither can we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the punishment or, you know, that you give me this good thing and take this away as we are negotiating. We should realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most bountiful and most merciful. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 60, you ask me and I will answer your prayer. Allah further says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 147, that what will Allah gain by your punishment if you believe and if you are grateful? That means it's not worth negotiating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we want, we can ask him. We cannot barter with him because he is so merciful. In fact, it will be our loss if we do that. And that reminds me of hadith of same Muslim, volume 4, book of Dikhar, hadith number 6501, that once Muhammad sallallahu he goes to one of the Muslims who is sick, and he goes to see him, and the person is very sick. Hadith says, as feeble as a chicken. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu asked him, that did you ask for something, or did you beg Allah for something? So the person says, yes, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that to hasten my punishment, what I'm going to get in Akhira, let me have it in this world. And then Allah's messenger says that you don't have the forbearance to bear the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, you should have asked, Rabbana atina fit dunya hasnata wa fil akhirati hasnata wa kina azab innar. That's what I quoted earlier. That, O oh Lord, give us the good in this world and the hereafter and save us from the torment of hellfire. Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 201. And after Prophet Muhammad prayed for him, then that Muslim became all right. So, we should always realize that the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond limits. So whatever may be our sin, whatever may be the sin we have committed, we can always seek Allah's forgiveness and He is most of forgiving, most merciful. No, oh, we have to be very careful what we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. The second question regarding Ramadan, the month of repentance, is a question which says, am I allowed to ask for the forgiveness of the sins of other people in my personal supplications, if I may, then how should I do so? It is not that you can, it is recommended that when you pray, you should pray for your other believing Muslims, other Muslim brothers and sisters. It's mentioned in several places. And it's further mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 19. It says, ask for forgiveness for yourself and the believing men and women. That means you ask for yourself, for forgiveness, as well as forgiveness for the believing men and women. And there's a dua of Nuh alayhi salam, Prophet Noah, in Surah Nuh, chapter number 71, verse number 28, where it says that Noah, peace be upon him, he paid to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that forgive me, my parents, and those who enter my house in faith. Forgive me, my parents, and those who enter my house in faith, 
and the believing men and women. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad it's mentioned in Hadith of Tirmidhi, Hadith number 3385, that the Prophet Muhammad whenever he used to ask forgiveness for others, first he used to start with himself. That forgive me and then say, forgive my Muslim brothers, sisters, etc. But you have to be careful, you cannot ask forgiveness for the unbelievers, for the mushriks. For Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 113, that it is not befitting for the Prophet and for the believing men and women to ask forgiveness for the pagans who are associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if they be your kith and kin, for those who you know are surely going to go to the hellfire. But you may ask for other things. You can ask for the health for an unbeliever. You can ask for the wealth for an unbeliever. That's perfectly fine. The best dua you can do for the mushrik, for unbeliever, is the hidayah, which our beloved Prophet Muhammad said. It's mentioned in Hadith of Tirmidhi, Hadith number 3681, where the beloved Prophet said that out of the two Umars, may Allah give hidayah to one Umar. And Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. Allah gave him hidayah and he accepted Islam. So you can always ask for hidayah of the unbelievers. That's the best dua you can do for them. SubhanAllah. May Allah give my mother hidayah in that case. Uh, inshallah. Amen. Dr. Zakir, next question is, is repentance accepted if the had punishment is not carried out on a person? As I mentioned earlier, that a person should realize that the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His mercy and grace is in abundance. And if you commit a crime, if it involves some other people, then you have to restore their property back. Like if you have robbed, then give the wealth back. Or if you're taking something from someone, give it back. But if it is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person should never be dissatisfied. He should never think that Allah will not forgive. Whatever sin he may commit, let it be the biggest sin. If he repents sincerely, as we mentioned in the last episode, Allah will forgive any sin. But if he has done some harm to some other human being, then he should try and undo it. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 68, and as for those who do not invoke with Allah any other God, or do not take any life of any other human being, unless for a just cause, or do not indulge in adultery, and for those who do it, for them there is a punishment. And Allah continues in the next verses. In Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 70, as for those who believe and repent and do righteous deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change the evil thing that he has done, the evil deed he has done to good. So that's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as far as the hath penalty is concerned, if it is the person who himself knows that he has done a sin, for example, if he has an adultery, so he should repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask for forgiveness. It is between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not required that he should tell to the others. Because if it's told, then the punishment would be there. And as I mentioned earlier about the case of the woman from Johanna, who told Allah's messenger, she had an adultery and she was pregnant. And the Prophet said that come later on. And she came later on after she gave birth to a child and she was stoned to death. The other example I gave of Maiz ibn Malik in the hadith of Sai Muslim, volume number three, hadith number 4205, which Maiz ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, he says to Allah's messenger that, O oh, Prophet, purify me. Allah's messenger says, go and repent and ask forgiveness. He again comes back and says, O oh, Allah's messenger, please purify me. He says, go away. Allah's messenger, please purify me. Again goes away. Fourth time he comes in and says, what is your? Purify you from what? Then he says, adultery. Then Allah's messenger asks him that, are you mad? Are you drunk? And then after that, very fine that he was not mad, he was not drunk. He had to pass the hath penalty. But then Allah Messenger said that both these two people, they had asked for forgiveness and they repented. So may Allah accept the repentance. But further it's mentioned in Hadith of Muatta, volume number two, Book of Punishment, Hadith number 12, the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that stop 
committing sins, major sins, etc. And if you commit, then you have to conceal it and ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You repent. And if you disclose it, then we will have to pass the hath penalty. That means if the sin is known to the sultan or the ruler or to a qadi or to a judge, then it becomes compulsory for that person that he has to pass the hath penalty. That is turning to death if he had an adultery or any other sin which requires the death penalty. But if it's not known and the person who has sinned if it involves some other human being, he should try and undo it. If it is involvement between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he should ask for forgiveness and ask for repentance and he should conceal. It's not a requirement that the punishment of had should be given to the person for repentance. But we have the examples of Maiz ibn Malik who repented and did not mind being killed for sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah forgive them and the Prophet said that even if you distribute it in the people of Medina, it will be sufficient for them for forgiveness. But as a general rule, it's not a requirement that you have to pass the penalty for repentance. If you're exposed, then the penalty is there. If you're not exposed, conceal it and ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you repent and inshallah Allah will forgive you. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. So, next question from a respected viewer is, I'd like to know, is performing ablution, i.e. wudu, necessary before making tawbah? And secondly, is ghusl necessary before tawbah if someone is unclean? As far as the text in the Quran is concerned, I don't know if any Quranic verses or any say hadith of the beloved Prophet which says that ablution or ghusl is necessary for a tawbah to be made. If you want to repent, you can repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Making wudu is not compulsory. Neither making ghusl is compulsory. He can ask for repentance directly, except if a person who is a non-believer, who is a mushrik, who is a kafir, when he accepts Islam, at that time, he has to make ghusl because that's hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He told to Qais bin Asim, may Allah be pleased with him, when you want to accept Islam, that you do ghusl, so that he's in a state of purity. Otherwise, for making tawbah, etc., wudu is not a requirement, neither is ghusl a requirement. Thank you for that concise answer, Dr. Zakir. And last but not least, Shaitan. <laughs> Question about Satan. Satan disobeyed Allah only once and he was accursed. Allah forgives human beings in spite of their disobedience, frequent disobedience, if they repent. Will Allah forgive Iblis if he repents today? If you read the Quran, the story of Adam salam and Iblis is mentioned several times in the Quran. In Surah Baqarah chapter 2, Surah Araf chapter number 7, Surah Hijjah chapter number 15, Surah Kahaf chapter number 18, several places. And if you realize in the story, the moment Adam salam, Adam peace be upon him, he realized his mistake, he repented Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah immediately forgave him. And if both of them, may Allah be pleased with them all. But if you note the story of Iblis, it's mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 14. When Iblis disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says that we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. All bow down, illa Iblis, except Iblis. Mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, Surah Araf, chapter 7. But instead of repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Iblis says in Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse 14, that give me respite till the day they are raised up. That means respite means, please delay my punishment. Give me respite and see what I do. He challenges Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I challenge you. So Allah says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 18, He gives them respite and says that all those women who will follow you, I will fill hell with all of you. And as far as Iblis repenting, here the question doesn't come because Allah further says in Surah Hijr, chapter 15, verse 34, that He is the accursed one. Then Allah has the knowledge of the future, of the unseen. So Allah knows in advance that this person, he will never repent. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, Allah says, Khatam Allah quloobihim, that Allah has put a seal on the hearts of those people, on those kafirs, and they will never come to the straight path. And similarly, we have examples of Allah predicts 
even about Abu Lahab. That he was one of the staunchest enemies of the beloved Prophet. Allah tells in advance, He reveals the surah, Tabbit da Abi Lahabi Watab, the father of the flame. He was one of the staunchest enemies to the Prophet. And he says that he will never accept Islam and he will burn in hell. It was a prediction. All he had to do to prove the Quran wrong was to say that I'm Muslim and say the Shahada. Ten years he had the opportunity, he did not do it. So Allah knew he will never repent. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that he believes he will never repent. So that is the reason he has said that he is to you an avowed enemy. Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 168 that, Ya amnu, O you believe, be careful of the khutwatu shaitan, of the footsteps of the devil, for he to you is an avowed enemy. So with all the verses of the Quran, we realize that Iblis will never repent, and Allah knows that, therefore he is called, he is the avowed enemy of the human being, and he is accursed. So he will never repent, he will never ask for forgiveness. Well, Dr. Zakia, we've reached the end of our question and answer session, and as we promised the viewers, we answered many questions on the topic of Ramadan, the month of repentance and supplication. supplication. Correct. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Uh, so brothers and sisters, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enlighten your hearts and my heart and Dr. Zakir Naik's heart with the information that we've given you and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to act on his advice during this holy month of Ramadan. Please do join us tomorrow when we will be addressing the topic Qiyam al-Layl. And I wish you all the best. وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتهو في كل بيت